En la noche del Lobo Cine os traigo una película de misterio y de terror. El fantasma que camina. Una producción estadounidense del año 1934 dirigida por Frank Strayer y protagonizada por John Milian y June Collin. Durante una noche tormentosa, un productor de teatro, su secretaria y el dramaturgo Prescott Ames sufren un accidente de coche cuando éste se sale de la carretera y queda atascado. Buscando refugio, se dirigen a la casa del Dr. Kent, un amigo de Ames. En la casa se encuentran con una paciente de Kent que actúa de manera extraña, y los residentes le informan que su comportamiento peculiar se debe al aniversario del asesinato de su esposo. Durante la cena, empiezan a surgir acusaciones sobre dicho asesinato cuando de repente se apagan las luces dando inicio a una serie de eventos misteriosos y aterradores. Con un reparto excepcional tales como John Milton interpretando a Prescott Ames, John Collier interpretando a Gloria Shaw, Richard Charles interpretando a Herman Wood o Henry Colker interpretando al Dr. Kent. La duración de la película son 69 minutos y está en versión original subtitulada al español. Sin más, os dejo con el fantasma que camina. Erskine, you're fired. Why, Mr. Wood, what is wrong? You! Well, it is your idea we come up to this forsaken hole over the weekend? If I die of pneumonia, it'll be your debt to society. Mr. Wood, I tried to be a competent secretary, but I have absolutely no control over the elements. How did I know it was going to rain? See, the paper says fair and warmer. That's last week's paper. You're still fired. How much further do we go? Won't be long now, Mr. Wood. Well, it better not be.
Mr. Ames. Oh, uh, hello, Carraway. I, I'm sorry. I didn't recognize this as Dr. Kent's house. Just a moment, Ames. I don't know who this Dr. Kent is, but I'm getting out of the storm even if it's to be the missing link. Yeah. Coming in, Miss Raines. Ames. Well, this is a surprise. Good to see you. Yes, I suppose it is a surprise. Uh, we skidded off the road, hit a tree, and became mired in mud, and yours is the nearest house. Oh, uh, pardon me, Dr. Kent. This is Herman Wood, the famous theatrical producer. You no doubt have heard of him, even if you haven't met him. Delighted, Mr. Wood. You're courageous to face the storms we have up here. Courageous? Insane, you mean. How do you do, sir? And uh, this is Homer Erskine, his secretary. How are you, Erskine? Oh, well. <laughs> I agree with you for once. Hello, Gloria. Glad to see me. More than you know. A certain gentleman here doesn't take our engagement seriously. Harry? Hello, Ames. How do you do? Gloria, this is Mr. Wood, Mr. Erskine, Miss Shaw, and Mr. Terry Gray. Oh, Mr. Wood, I've heard so much about you. Yeah, I was afraid of that. How are you, young man? Still quite normal, thank you. Nice of you all to drop in like this. Your idea, wasn't it, Ames? After all, you were invited. That had nothing to do with it, and I assure you, I wouldn't be here now if I could help it. We were just driving to my place where Mr. Wood was going to hear me read my latest play. Another play, Preston? My, you are prolific. Well, play or no play, I ought to be in New York, in bed. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to remain my guest for the night. My chauffeur tells me the roads are completely out. Oh, forgive me for keeping you in these wet things. I'll have Cataway show you to some rooms immediately. Then you'll join us for a cocktail before dinner for your staying, of course. Well, I like the cocktail part of the program. Oh, Caraway, take Mr. Ames and his friends upstairs immediately, owing to the storm they're going to stay for the evening. Yes, sir. This way, please. Who are you? Why, I'm... Uh, I, you tell her. I'm beginning to be uncertain of everything. Why, this is Mr. Woods. I'm Mr. Erskine's, his secretary. I pity you so much. You're surrounded by tragedy and sorrow. Well, you are psychic, Beatrice. Mr. Wood is the greatest producer of tragedies and dramas in the country. You mean he was? Hey, uh, Ames, about this play of yours. Why, yes, it's in my bag. As long as we can't reach my place, why not let me read it to you here? I just remembered an important appointment tomorrow in the city. I must return tonight. Uh, isn't that right? Yes, uh, absolutely. He has to address the Traveler's Aid Society on the proper way to fold a timetable. My dear Mr. Wood, uh, I would gladly assist you, but until this summer bitch, there's no way of reaching the city. Well, we may as well accept the situation, Mr. Wood. We'll have a good dinner and then retire to Dr. Kent's study for a nice, quiet reading. Perhaps uh, it'll make you appreciate my play all the more. They say a full stomach breeds tolerance. Well, something tells me I shall need it. Mr. Ames, this is your room. You've used it before. This way, gentlemen, please. This is yours, sir. And this is yours. Just a moment. Have that coat dried out. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. Anything else, sir? Yes. Close the door when you go out. Yes, sir.
Anne, the ghost walks tonight or never. You don't sound very hopeful. To the contrary. Not only hopeful, but brave. I'm going to ask you to marry me and go to California. Where the sun always shines and the oranges fall from the trees to your breakfast table. <laughs> That's a beautiful picture on a stormy night like this. But with or without the oranges and sunshine, you know I won't marry you, Terry, because I love someone else. Terry! Pardon me? You're not a very easy man to discourage, are you? You forget that Gloria here is engaged to a mutual friend of ours. I don't think that's any of your business. Look here, Grace. I don't like your attitude. In fact, I don't think I like anything about you. So what? Why must you two always act like gladiators? Be sensible. The night of all nights must not be the time for any discord. You know I've never given you cause to think of me as more than a friend. That depends on your viewpoint. I might argue that statement. I'd like to give you the thrashing you deserve for those insinuations. Please. We'll discuss this later. that scream? <laughs> yes, you sounded like a grand opera star with acute indigestion. <laughs> Worse than that, sounded like something I'm human. Oh, pure imagination. If I allowed a noise like that to scare me, your voice would have killed me long ago. Look here, are you trying to insinuate I'm afraid? I, I, I'm just nervous, that's all. What, what kind of a madhouse is this? Oh, and don't be so excitable. It's probably your liver acting up again. Have you your pill? Oh, my pill. Any of you folks hear a scream? Yes, it frightened me too. Uh, yes, I can't understand where it came from. Tell them where it came from, Ames. You've heard it before. Why scare your friends unnecessarily? Perhaps you're right. Any scream you may have heard probably came from Beatrice's room. She's uh, Dr. Kent's patient and uh, Mr. Gray's sister. You met her at the foot of the stairs. She's just a little uh, irrational at times. Well, as far as I know, it's nothing to worry about. Simply emotional outbursts. Don't you just love a night like this? This old house seems to belong in the rain and thunder. I read a book once about an old, old house. And oh, I don't know how many murders happened on just such a night as this. <laughs> Was that, was that the clock? I, yes, I, 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 I guess so. I, I, I think so. It must have been. But it's a union clock. What do you mean? Well, uh, it, it strikes any old time. Yes, John. I am waiting for you. I am waiting. That woman gives me goose pimples. I've seen saner people than her in asylum. I'm sorry this had to happen. Beatrice's spells are unnerving to a stranger, but after one gets to know her... Know her? Say, if I never see her again, I'll be satisfied. Now, if you'll be so kind as to find some method for me to leave this house, see that I take it. Oh, Prescott, we...
We couldn't let you do that with your friend. I think your friend is unduly alarmed, Ames. Oh, is that so? Well, who asked you? He has high blood pressure. He should calm himself. Oh. Miss Beatrice's actions are nothing to fear. She simply dwells in the unknown. As her attending physician, I can speak freely. The girl suffers from hallucinations and the shock of a tragedy that occurred in this house three years ago this night. Mr. Ames remembers that night very distinctly, no doubt. That's why he shuns my house. Dr. Kent, I see no reason for making my sister's grief public talk. I bet the doctor's going to tell us about some terrible operation. That ought to be cheerful. The unsolved murder of your sister's husband must be public talk in this house. Murder? I have taken notes on her actions since that night, and each year, at this hour, the flutter of that sound is heard, and she has acted as though the spirit of John, her dead husband, had returned to her. That's all there is to it. <laughs> Erskine, we're leaving. Dinner is served, sir. No, we're not. Ghosts are no ghosts. We're eating. We're leaving. You're disobeying my orders. No, I'm not. You fired me an hour ago. Gloria, Mr. Ames, Mr. Wood, Mr. Erskine. Hope you're all as hungry as I am. Just give me an aspirin. Just give me anything but a tomato surprise. I've had shocks enough. This is about as cheerful as an undertaker's picnic in a cemetery. You're right on time, John. I was so afraid you might disappoint me. <laughs> Mr. Wood, I, I, I think you're right. Uh, uh, we better leave now that John's here. Yes, Erskine. I'm not a cowardly man by nature, but my nerves won't stand this any longer. That woman is dangerous. My friends, please. I regret these unusual disturbances, but I've experienced these same phenomena in my patient's presence before. There's nothing to fear from the dead. I believe in spirits, but only a spirit. Hear me? Beatrice, please, your brother wishes you to restrain yourself. My dear brother seems frightened. As well he should be. Just like all the rest of you are. Please, Beatrice, there are guests here, friends of Mr. Ames. What do they mean to me? You, Terry Gray. You, Miss Gloria Shaw, and you, my delightful friend, know what that blood stain is. You were at this table the night poor John fell forward to stain the cloth with his own blood. The night he was murdered by one of you. Well, that's a lie. Open that door. Where? I'll call the police. Well, this is outrageous. Open that door. Unloosen that portal. I'm sorry, Miss Beatrice's orders are that no one leave. Jarvis is only partly correct. I gave that order. What's the idea? The idea, my friend, is to protect my patient's health. Any interruption might cause the loss of her sanity. You want the responsibility for that on your shoulders? I think you're as crazy as she is. Uh, uh, don't, don't aggravate him. They're all dangerous. You can't frighten me into anything. I don't know who killed your husband, but I believe your brother can tell you. I thought you'd try to insinuate something like that, and I'm glad you did. Now I can voice what I've suspicioned these past years. You were jealous of John. You wanted to marry Beatrice for a money. You, a penniless hack playwright. She preferred John, and you killed him. There's always been insanity in your family. Wait, he's right. I too always thought you killed John. You're unscrupulous enough to have done it. That's enough of that kind of talk. You aren't free from suspicion either. As John's cousin, you inherited more money from his death than I did. How dare you say that? I can't listen any longer. 
In the name of humanity, allow Lester and I to get out of here before they kill each other. I appreciate that we have outside witnesses to what is going to happen. There is a murderer in this room and we're going to find him. John, John, tell me the person who killed you. Speak quickly. Why don't you admit it? Hurry, before it is too late. You'll talk now or I'll break your neck. Lunch! John! 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 Speak to me, John! Simon, get on those legs! Hey, where's Beatrice? Well, I don't know. Dr. Kent, I demand I be allowed to leave this room. And I'm with you. Remember my years of devotion to you. Divided we arrive, but united we leave. Of course I'd give anything in the world if this hadn't happened. Jarvis, open that door. Oh, Mr. Wood, I'll see you later. You will not see me later. Not for a month, not for ten years. I'm getting out of here. And so ends the first act of my little play. <laughs> oh, darling, it was wonderful. Well, we <laughs> certainly scared those two. <laughs> yes, it was famous for his temper. <laughs> Isn't it remarkable how they reacted almost exactly as you had written them into your play? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm hired, and with two more acts to go. Well, you're as clever a group of actors as I've ever seen. <laughs> And I've got glory to thank for finding you. Didn't I tell you they were troopers? <laughs> you don't think we frightened them too much, do you? What's the difference? <laughs> it's a blooming aura of triitis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jarvis, go get Beatrice. <laughs> Good old Beatrice. She certainly played her part well. <laughs> Yay! But I was afraid she wouldn't scram before the lights turned up. <laughs> Beatrice, are you hurt? Beatrice, what's the matter? Speak. She's dead. This is my room. No. And whoever it does belong to has a gun. A gun? No, no, no. Uh, let's don't annoy. Oh, shut up. This may come in handy. A manuscript. The ghost walks by Prescott Ames. As the group seat themselves at the table, the vacant chair also moves out as if an invisible person was preparing to sit down. All eyes are on the chair. As the vacant chair slides back to the table, Beatrice addresses its invisible occupant. Beatrice, speak. You are right on time, John. Thurston, we've been witnessing a dress rehearsal of Ames's horror play. You mean all those scares were part of the play? Certainly. Wait. Here, let's try it again. Here, listen to this. My play has been surpassed. We have a real menace in this house. Well, there was no one in the house but us, and we were all in the dining room. I know I was. That's right, because I was struggling with you. I was sending you the light switch. Yes, and I was at the table, as you all know. I was playing ghost. I was all over the room. But I didn't do it, I tell you. I didn't do it. Of course you did. Now, don't lose your head. Don't any of us. A death-like face slowly appears in the dark, ghostly white and pallor. The face seems to float as it reaches the table. Beatrice, hysterically, John, lights out. Everyone remains where Stanley, with the exception of Beatrice, 
who disappears through a door in the kitchen. So they thought they'd impress me with their phony theatricals, eh? Me, who staged the burning of Rome while the gladiators were be gored to death in the animal pits. I wasn't scared a bit. <laughs> Neither was I. So, uh, what are you doing under the table? Well, uh, I was looking for you. Ridiculous. I hate cowards. When we get back to town, remind me to fire you. Let the play continue. Now that the play is over, I'll have to tell Wood what's happened. Here he comes now. Ha! Still making merry, I see. Well, we thought we'd come down again. It's too quiet upstairs for us. Yes, we were used to shrieks, sirens, and suicide. Yeah. Why, what seems to be the trouble? Has Miss Beatrice been found? Yes, she has been found. Dead. Is that so? No, I mean, I mean, it can't be, it can't be, uh, it's impossible. What are you talking about? Mr. Wood, I'm trying to tell you that Beatrice is dead. Beatrice is dead? I don't believe it. Let's put this whole thing straight to you, Mr. Wood. We're all actors, hired by Ames here to present his play to you. Actor? Everything that's happened since you arrived was part of the play. Except for Beatrice is dead. Mr. Ames, am I to understand that I've been witnessing part of the play you were to read to me? Yes, I thought it a good method of presenting it to you. You see, this is really my house, and the fallen tree on the road was all part of my scheme to fool you. The storm, of course, was an added break. Well, if these chills and frills uh, have been theatricals, uh, where does the death of Beatrice fit in? Surely you, you don't destroy your characters. Somebody evidently does. We don't know any more about it than you do. The police should be notified. Now, wait a moment, everyone, please. I know that this is even more confusing to Mr. Wood than it is to us. He still believes we're putting on the play. So the only thing we can do is to show him Beatrice. By all means, do. Yes, death is no novelty to us. No. We stage it eight times a week, including matinee. And benefits. Now, remember, no one is to touch the body until the police arrive. In there. Well, where is she? I don't know. What could have happened? Well, you ought to know. You were the author. Why can't she be? Perhaps she just stepped out during the intermission. <laughs> Gentlemen, <laughs> this is too serious for joking. She was on that divan ten minutes ago, dead. You've got to believe it's for your own safety. Oh, and you think we're all in danger? We most certainly are. We've got to search this house and find Beatrice and a person who... I wonder who that could be. Well, we never find out until we answer. I will. We all will. Who are you? Who are you? A guard from the Greystone Sanitarium. Seen anything of an escape patient around here? What kind of a patient? A quiet one, until disturbed, at which time he becomes slightly murderous. Well, so help me if this ain't a night. Oh, what's going to happen to us next? Who are these people? I didn't know anyone was living here until I saw the light. Which makes you think you came here. Empty houses make good hideouts. I never saw or heard of anyone living here in the past few years. Well, I've been living here about a month. I think you've come to the right house at that. Yes? Has anything happened? Uh-huh. A murder and a disappearance. What are you thinking about? Winking? Why, my dear man, you're saying things. I simply stated a murder had been committed. Murder? 
Ah. Well, it's him all right, then. Well, who is this man you're looking for? At the sanitarium, we'd call him Case 222. I guess you'd call him a homicidal maniac. A maniac? And you think he's loose in this house? Now, be perfectly calm. If my patient is here, and you scare him with hysterics, he might tear you apart to see what caused the excitement. That reminds me. Has anyone caught the parent? Uh, no. Well, uh, that's the usual procedure, isn't it? Well, we forgot to, I suppose. But there's a telephone right here in the study. A telephone? I suppose no one knows who did this. Why should we? You don't think it's fun to be isolated with a maniac? If the play calls for it, yes. Well, I don't know what the rest of you are going to do, but I am driving into town for the police. Wait, it isn't safe outside. I'll walk with you to the garage. Thanks. I'll be right back. So those who want to go to bed are safe enough. Besides, it's easier to die in bed. Come on, Ken, let's turn in. It's as safe up there as here if we lock our bedroom door. <laughs> What's the idea? Why, you're choking terribly. Well, can you do any better? You know, I had a hunch that Beatrice would never appear in a horror play. Why? Too highly strung, an impressionable, a fatalist. She figured if you were paid to scare people, the law of compensation would see to it that you got scared yourself. Utter nonsense. How could anyone possibly foresee a maniac coming here tonight and committing murder? <laughs> Don't interrupt him. The play is improving. Not enough action for me. <laughs> Tell me, Ames, just how did you happen to come to this house yourself? Funny you should mention that. I was just asking myself the same question. Of course, you saw that painting in the drawing room of Gussie Gillis. Sure, everybody knew him. And his history? Naturally. Personally, I thought he was the worst butcher who ever severed a tonsil. Right. And you remember how nine of his patients mysteriously disappeared after he treated them? They were murdered. And when the police came to arrest him right here in this house, he committed suicide. He lost his mind from the strain of his surgical work, I guess. Get to the point, man. I know all that record. Now, you say this house was his. How did you get it? Why, that was easy. I simply advertised for an old, isolated country home. And the real estate agent for the Gillis estate answered and said he'd be glad to rent me this place. It's been vacant ever since the doctor's death. People were afraid to live in it because of the crimes that were committed here. Supposed to be haunted. And the local people swear they've seen the lights go on and off in this house even while it stood unoccupied. Well, the rest of the story is short. I wanted to write a play in the same atmosphere he had lived his ghoulish life, so here I am. I'll bet he'll come back to haunt you for this. Did Jarvis get away all right? Yes. Yeah. There's no one around the ground, so I think I'll search upstairs. I'll go up, too. I'm going to bed. And I'm resigning from your cast. You playwrights are all screwy. I take it that this ends the second act. Now, if you don't mind me saying so, I think your play is rotten. <laughs> well spoken, Eskin. Forget about being fired. Let's go to bed. Yes, go to bed, Mr. Wood, and get some sleep. You insist the play is still on, but we've tried to tell you that it's ended in a tragedy. Good night, sir. Good night, Miss Lurie. Good night. Ames? Good night. Be sure and let us know if anyone else is murdered. I can't convince those fools. They insist we're still playing for their benefit. Oh, I wish we were out of this dreadful house. First it was Terry pestering me, and now this awful tragedy of tonight. Don't worry, dear. You look all worn out. You get some sleep, and I'll see that nothing disturbs you. Oh, I'm too frightened to sleep. Tell me the truth. Who do you think could have killed Beatrice, and where do you think she could be? Well, uh, personally, I believe it was just a burglar who's long since disappeared. Then why would he steal the body? Oh, to cover up the crime, I suppose. Now you go to bed, dear. Why, Gloria, what is it? <laughs> you poor kid, your nerves have completely gone.
Oh, it's you. I ought to pull the trigger at that. Well, come on, snap out of it. What is it? Mr. Wood, maybe we're wrong. Maybe this isn't the play we're witnessing after all. Oh, rubbish. You saw the manuscript, didn't you? Yes, but I didn't see anything in it about the top of my bed coming down and smothering me, just like a steak under onions. Oh, nonsense. You've had too many cocktails. Besides, I wouldn't be lucky enough to celebrate your demise by violence. That's a fine way for you to talk to me. Me, who has been everything to you but a mother. Now, Mr. Wood, listen to reason. I may be all wrong. I'm a nervous man by nature. But if this play is still going on, it's the closest thing to reality I ever saw behind the footlights. Oh, you're a sissy. I tell you, this fellow Raines is clever. He has reality in this play, and that's what the public wants. Now, let me alone. And if you want to stay in the theatrical business, stop letting it scare you. Oh, I, I was kidding all the time. That bed bracket was only a dream I had. And you were in it, too. I was not. I was reading. Yes, I, I saw that. You were reading a book on psychics. You were worried about the future yourself. Say, go home and go to bed, will you, please? And if you want to think of the future, remember I'm firing you. Mr. Wood, I have a premonition that we must stick together tonight. You need protection. You mean you do. You're trying to muscle into my bed because you're frightened. Go home. Oh, my dear employer, play or no play, I have no relish for my own couch. Move over. Say, this is all Tommy rot. You've got the mind of an oyster and the nerve of an acrobat. As my secretary, I do allow you to share my office, but that does not include my bed. Say... You were born in October, weren't you? Yes, uh, during the National Apple Week. Why? It says here, your type is the instincts of a bloodhound, the heritage of the homing pigeon, the attributes of the ferret, and the heart of a lion. Yet you snuggle beneath my quilts, you cream puff, because of make-believe play is scaring you. You're fired once and for all. Will you please close my mouth if I'm snoring? I have adenoids. Adenoids, too. My heart. Homing pigeon. Ferret. Lion. I'm sleeping in a zoo. You know I love you. Why do you always give me the cold shoulder? I'm just not interested, Terry. Why did you come here? It makes it very embarrassing. Oh, I know. You're afraid your playwright sweetheart would be jealous if he knew I was here. Well, I... I wish he could see you now. I just came in to say goodbye. I'm walking out on this play. But I've got a curtain speech to make. And this is it. See what you've done. I'll hide in that closet until he goes. If you tell him I'm here, I'll tell you invited me. Understand? Oh. Oh, darling, what frightened you? I I saw a man. Oh, where was he? He came in that door. I screamed and, and he went away. Oh, you poor kid, what a narrow escape you had. I wonder what that feeling was about. But the light in Gloria's room. Let's see what's up. You take it easy. I'll find a guard. We'll search the house again. What's happened? We heard a scream. Someone tried to break into Gloria's room. What? Who? I don't know. Here comes the guard. Feel anything? Plenty. Gloria was almost attacked by someone. Fancy that. 
Who do you think it was? I don't know. We'll wake up everybody and find out. Good idea. Let's try Terry first. Oh, Terry. Oh, not a sign of them. Whose room is this? Well, that's mine. And there's Erskine's room and that's Mr. Woods. Well, let's see what they know. Empty. Darn the luck. I wonder if that maniac could have tried Woods' room before my mind snaps too. Eh? Oh. Hey, you two. Get out of here. My office hours are from 10 to 4. Seen anything strange in here? Yeah. Here's an exhibit that ought to be in a museum. What are you doing in here? I was sleeping. Is the play on again? No. We're just having a roll call. Well, consider us absent. Terry. Terry, come out. Gloria. What again? Who oh, let go this there? I might as well be a fireman. Gloria, what is it, dear? It's Terry. He was standing right in that closet. He disappeared. Well, what was Terry doing in your closet? He... He was hiding. From whom? Why, I... Oh, pardon me. Oh, no, please let me explain. Uh, it isn't necessary. I think I understand. I'd sooner trust a lunatic than I would a yes, woman. Yes, they're more reliable. Strange how anyone could disappear from behind a nightgown. You could from behind my cousins. She weighs 250. <laughs> Are you winking at me again? Say, <clears throat> let's go down and get a drink. This isn't a horror play, it's a bedroom farce. I don't think this situation is fair to me. You people are a very little help. That patient of mine is evaporating. He thinks all I've got to do is to look for him. Besides, I promised to be a fourth of bridge tonight with some friends of mine. Speaking of wasting time, Jarvis should have been back in town with the police long ago. Oh, Carraway. Well, you and Kent go back upstairs, please, just to be near Gloria. I couldn't stand seeing her myself just now, but I don't want to expose her to unnecessary danger. I understand. We'll be glad to help. I'd just as soon go up again anyway. I'm dead. Please don't use that word. I don't like that fellow Carraway. Oh, forget it. He's just a seedy butler. Well, I feel duty bound to see this night through. I live here and all that, but I'm beginning to reach a breaking point. The situation is getting out of hand. It seems to me you're about as useless a guard as I've ever seen. Well, I've worked in two penitentiaries and three asylums and never had any complaints. Best actor in the bunch. Well, boys. I'm going to retire from town for the second time tonight. Ames, go on with your rehearsal, but don't disturb me for the finale. And again I say, <laughs> uh, Please continue. I never walk out on anything that doesn't cost me something. What does he mean? Oh, these fools think we're putting on a play for their benefit. I'm hungry. I could destroy a few vitamins myself. Well, you'll find some food in the kitchen. I'll be waiting for you here.
Hello? What are you doing down here? Why, I, I just came down to get some cigarettes. Well, you shouldn't have left Laurie upstairs alone. Well, I'm not her guardian. If you're so anxious about her, why don't you go upstairs and play watchman yourself? That's just what we're both going to do. Well, the thing is, so do I. This is all your fault. I told you not to leave her alone. We'll arouse everyone. Oh, Kent. Oh, Mr. Wood. He's probably in his room. I shouldn't cue you, but here comes Kent now. Oh, Kent. Yes? What, what Glory has disappeared. Huh? Say, have you been out in the rain? No, why? Well, whoever stole Gloria took her out of the window into the rain. Funny that you should be out of your room and then appear all wet. I don't like your insinuations, Mr. Ames. But you must know I couldn't sleep. I was going to take a bath in the tub and turn on the shower by mistake. That's what I would call a watertight alibi. Maybe Mr. Wood knows something. I'd have more privacy in a convention hall. Come in. Mr. Woods and gentlemen to see you. Have you seen Gloria? She doesn't seem to be here. Why? Gloria has been kidnapped. <laughs> goody, goody. I say, that's beastly rude of you. They accused me, but I think Teddy's the guilty one. He's gone too. They've got to search the whole place over again. Get up and see the fun. It's better than looking for a good candidate before an election. Not me. I'm staying right here. Now, if they don't stop this fool play and get out of here, I'll rid the world of the entire cast. All right, stay here. I hope you're the next victim. Uh, Mr. Wood, could I have a word with you? If you try to get in this bed again, I'll shoot just to help me. I only wanted to say that you're right, as usual. The play is still going on. Of course I'm right. I know the theater like Barnum knew his elephant. And I'm not cross with you, will you? In fact, I'm going to raise your salary. Uh, thanks. People don't disappear every five minutes in real life. Unfortunately, some don't. I'd like to get some sleep. But, but the play... Earn some of the money that I pay you by watching it for me. Why, I thought you fired me. Not till we get back to town. Now, shut up and... Shut up. Guard! Guard! Huh? What do you want? Fine, help you are. Glory has been stolen. You're standing around here eating chicken. Well, one was seen occasionally. What makes you think the lady was stolen? Rather an antiquated way to acquire a woman, isn't it? Oh, shut up. Her window was open. She must have been taken out of the house. I'm going to search the ground. I'm with you, Wayne. Hey, you. Come here. Where's your friend? If you mean my honored employer, he's upstairs in bed. I think I'll go up and look him over. There's something queer about you both. He winks at you and you wink at me. <laughs> and I don't like it. You make a careful search of the ground. You go that way, now go this. We'll search of the house, and I'll meet you front. Right. right. You're not really a, an asylum guard, are you? No. How did you get? Yeah. You can't fool an old-timer. 
You know, you're wasting your talents here. You're too good for this stuff. The whole world knows that. I said good, not perfect. Like that play. You know, I've been thinking that over. It's mighty darn gripping. I think it's pathetically bad. I'll have no part in it. Are you under contract to Ames? Me? I should say not. But I'm ready for the presentation now that will astound the world. I believe you are. I'll bet you'd be a sensation and a good part. And I'm going to give it to you. Kerman Wood, the man who has given more stars to Broadway than Edison has electric lights, will star you personally in an extravaganza. Splendid, splendid. Oh, uh, are you busy uh, Thursday? Let me see. No, I have nothing planned. Good. Come to my office next Thursday and you'll sign a contract. Splendid. But you should see me work first. What are you doing now? Wasting time talking to you. Come with me, and I will show you real dramatic. Are you kidding? I never joke. I will show you drama. Stark, throbbing drama. With a master touch of comedy. By golly, I'm with you. Just wait till I get my slippers. Don't forget, Thursday. Come. I'd feel a lot safer if I had my gun. Where is it? Home. That's okay with me. Let's go over to your house and hang around. Soon be daylight. Thank heaven. Then. Anything new? We made a complete search of the grounds and found nothing. Well, how much longer is this going on? I'm getting tired of sitting around here and waiting for something that doesn't happen. Yes, I admit this is a, a, a picture. It's alive. It winged. What's the matter with him? He must be balmy. to you. Remember when I left the house to get the car and the cook? Yes. Well, that nuthouse guard leaves me at the garage. Then just as I'm getting into the car, somebody slugged me with a lead pipe. What was the idea? Well, someone didn't want him to get away. And that someone is probably the escape nut that we're looking for. How many of you are searching for him? There's already been a guard here tonight. Well, there's possibly half a dozen of us. But believe you and I'll find him. Yeah, this guy disappears every so often. But we always spot him in this neighborhood. I see. Well, after you were hit on the head, why did you come back to the house? I figured getting the police was the wisest move to make. I'd been knocked out and tied in the garage. But I broke the ropes. Then I tried to start the car. But I found out someone had gummed up the motor. Well, I began to hoof it into the village when these guards from the sanitarium picked me up, and here we are. Has anything happened since I left? Yes, Gloria's been kidnapped and Terry's disappeared. And now that Erskine person's gone violent. Oh, yeah? Well, I'll handle that. Help! Help! What's the matter? Help. Mr. Wood is gone. What? I said he's gone, and so is the guard. Is that thick here that's doing it? Oh, what's the matter with it? His eyes moved. It glared at me. Why, it's as solid as the wall. You're daffy. Those eyes never stared out of nothing but a paint pot. I say someone looked out of that painting. Okay, brother, we'll soon find out who's nuts around here. Say, he's right. These eyes are phony. What'd I tell you? Now who's that? Say, there's a passageway back to this. Passageway? A passageway. Look, it's moving. That's how Beatrice disappeared from this room. Well, I'm going to find out where it leads to. I'll go with you. Be careful, it looks dangerous.
My friend, since your entrance into this house, I have worked toward bringing you into this laboratory. Years ago, a famous surgeon lived, worked, and studied here. His name was Guthrie Gillis. He is dead now, but I, Professor Elmer Twittery, will carry on and improve his work. Hey, I don't like these underground places. Well, you may as well get used to it. You may spend a lot of time in one. Why, the whole house must be honeycombed with passages. They lead all directions. I am the greatest genius you have ever seen. I have mastered my work. Work that has produced power almost divine. <laughs> I have become more than the greatest plastic surgeon in the world. I am the molder of mankind. I have reached a great decision. That is why I've allowed you all to trespass upon the seclusion that I have enjoyed in a supposedly deserted house. I discovered this old house at Dr. Gillis's on one of my many escapes from the sanitarium. It is admirably fitted for my work. All I needed was patience. And now I have you. Healthy people who can't stand the rigor of certain small operations. Well, wait. This looks like a door. See where that leads to. This patient you're looking for, is he violent? Sometimes. He almost killed a guard tonight when he stole his uniform. Oh, and he winked, didn't he? Leads into an open room with a swinging bookcase. Then Gloria did see something in that study. We've got to find it before anything happens to her. It seems to me this is the fluid I used to paralyze the mice with yesterday. I think I meant to use it on your friend Beatrice. But somehow, I became somewhat confused. So now the poor girl is dead. Forgive my stupidity. I will be more careful to see that you don't suffer the accidental death she did. I have brought back the spark of life. I am colossal. Oh, my head aches. Get that knife out of the way you're choking me. I am awfully embarrassed. I thought I killed you, but I only gave you a headache. ask your indulgence in looking at this chart. You will notice the various noses, eyes, and chin. You all have an ideal, a face you envy. You can have your choice of alteration. You understand my operations run in series. You may look as you wish now, utterly I will slowly change you to fit my model. Young lady, you shall have the honor of being the first on my table. I shall require very little from any of you. Just enough to begin my work. A feature from you, a bone from him, and a cartilage from that one. 
It's the guard. It's Professor Twiddly, the guy we're looking for. Then he's the nut. Well, he's dangerous. Let's get him. Wait a minute. Better not get him excited. I know how to handle him. Hello, Professor. Why, Mr. McLeavy, what are you doing here? Can't you see I'm busy? Sure, but you've got to come home with us. It's important. Oh, is there anything wrong? Why, don't you remember? You operated on your old friend, Julius Caesar, a couple of days ago. Did I now? <laughs> Funny, I forgot. How did it turn out? Not so good. That's why we have to hurry back. You see, he got tired of his Roman nose, so you grafted on a new one. But you put it on upside down. And on rainy nights like this, the poor fellow can't go out for fear of drowning. My, my. We'll return at once. Poor Caesar must be miserable. Oh, Prisca, take me out of here. I never want to see another horror play. Well, don't worry. I'll never write another one. Yes, you will. What? Absolutely, but you've got to rewrite it. <laughs> Just like this night and the experiences we've gone through. Even to the murder of Beatrice? Yes, I'm afraid Beatrice will have to die all over again. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ghost walks after all. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations, John. You were all about too, Caraway. Thank you, Mr. Woods. Now, what's the matter with you? I was just thinking how terrible it would have been had the professor really operated on us and changed us all. You might have gotten my adenoid, and I would have gotten your false teeth. Erskine, turn your face to the setting sun. Oh! What's the idea? Don't forget, you're fired. Oh, Mr. Wood. Come. <laughs> 